whenever the truth came out that what they were producing was addictive, whether it was junk food or cigarettes, they would say, you chose to smoke, you chose to eat, so you're responsible for any health consequences. Same is happening with the tech industry already. Uh, game makers are saying the kids are choosing to play. They or their parents are responsible. They give us these tools so we will think we are able to, we're responsible. We can choose how much time we want to spend online. And so I, I think it's important to look at this because it also shows us the way out. And if you see where this argument of self-responsibility breaks, it's with children. Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Hi there. Thanks for tuning in. That voice you heard in the intro is Gaia Bernstein. Gaia is joining us today to talk about addictive technology. She's the author of a new book called Unwired, Gaining Control Over Addictive Technologies. Many of us, including myself, have made great efforts to control our technology use. You might be using the built-in screen time feature on your phone, locking your phone up in a case safe, making contracts with your kids, going to great lengths individually to handle these addictive technologies. Gaia is a lawyer, a law professor, and the co-director of the Institute of Privacy Protection and the co-director of the Gibbons Institute for Law Science and Technology at Seton Hall University. She writes and lectures on the intersection of law, technology, health, and privacy. And she's also the mom of three kids. And while she admits, of course, we can make an effort on an individual level, it's hard. And what will be more effective is trying to make change within our communities and on a policy level. In our conversation today, we are exploring the idea of digital connection and how when we're connected to someone on the internet, it doesn't necessarily mean that we feel fulfilled and have intimacy. She goes into a lot more detail to help us understand the impact of addictive technology, what it is, what it looks like, and how it's impacting our lives. I hope you enjoy this chat with Gaia. You can find the links to the things we talk about in the show notes. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hi, Gaia. How are you? Hi. Thank you for having me. I am so happy to have you here. I have talked about technology, technology overuse, um, technology addictions, all these topics on the podcast before, but I feel like often we cover it through the lens of a psychologist or in the field of psychology, but you're a lawyer. So tell us what your connection is to this topic. My first connection is just uh, living in this society, having three kids, and seeing how things changed around 2015, 2016. I started noticing how I was changing, how I would sit down to work, and after two hours, I would get nothing done, and I, I really spent my whole time texting and emailing and just browsing the internet. And I was looking at my kids' lives and I would go to a show and I would sit there and suddenly you couldn't see the stage because everybody was holding up their iPad and you had to look at the stage for the iPad. Nobody was directly looking at the show. And I started thinking about all of this and I tried to change my own life, but I wanted to do more. And I had the opportunity as the director of the Institute for Privacy Protection of my law school to start a program to go to schools and we, my law school and I, we went to schools, half a dozen schools in New York and New Jersey, ranging public schools in Newark, private schools in Manhattan, the full range. And my law students talked to students who just got their first cell phone, so they were fifth, sixth grade, uh, about privacy, but a lot about balancing online, offline uh, use. And I spoke to parents about that. And when I started out, I, I thought it was about two, 2017, and I thought people don't realize the problem. So once we talk to them and they'll get the problem, this will stop. 
And it was true, people were not aware that everybody was suffering from the same issue, and that was helpful. But after a year, and people there was much more publicity, and I felt of talking to them, and they were sounding a bit desperate because they already tried a lot of the self-help measures, and they tried to do things themselves, and nothing seemed to be changing. And at that point, I thought, I was thinking of writing a book before, but I thought I'll just talk about how we have to be aware and then I realized there's much more going on here. And there was also evidence about how the tech companies were involved. And I ended up writing a very different book about how we should, as a society, fight against this. Right. And it is, I think, so much more complex than many of us are aware of. Can you define what addictive technology is? So I think um, it start, everybody started defining, you said that psychologists were the first people to deal with this. So they used the term addiction because that's the term that's been used before. So you can, some people are really clinically addicted to a technology. Uh, they basically, they get to a point they prefer playing a game over, you know, any other activities that are unable to stop things go wrong in their life, in school or in work, and they keep going. And that's an addiction. But what's happening with technologies here is that they're affecting all of us. They're making us all stay online for much longer than we expect to. So at the end, I, I we all tend to overuse our technologies because of that, because we think we're staying on for five minutes and, hey, I just lost half an hour of my time. How did this happen to me? Yeah. And I think that we often look at our kids and we can be critical or maybe maybe critical is the wrong word, maybe more thoughtful about the way that our kids are engaging in screen time. And we don't pay all that much attention to our own as adults. Right. I think people see, because people feel it very much when the kids suddenly disappear, because you have this sweet child and you spend so much time engaging with a child and suddenly the child is not paying attention and they just looking at the screens and you talk to them and you can't communicate and you try to, try to take the iPad away and they get so angry and you, people think, what happened to my sweet child? And I, you, you're right. They don't realize that they come home and they're on their phone and they're answering work emails or they're texting the babysitter or they're trying to order the groceries. And on the one hand, we're all busy people. We all have to do that. But that's what the child is seeing. And there are there is a lot of research showing that there's modeling involved here, that kids whose parents use uh, their screens more are likely to be much more heavy users. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. A year ago, March of 2022, I made some big changes in my own screen use. You know, podcasting meant that I was spending a lot of time on social media, helping to promote the podcast, helping to um, get in touch with the people who are listening to the podcast. And I realized sort of at the end of February 2022, I looked at my screen time and I think I was spending about 27 hours a week on social media which is a whole day, one whole day a week, which <laughs> yeah. blew my mind. Um, and I was just like, yeah, this doesn't feel good. And I have, I would say, nine, cut 95% of my social media use out. It's great. I think it's fantastic you were able to do that. I, I think lots of people want to do that, but just don't succeed. And really, the most help we get from tech companies after they design their products to make sure we stay online for much longer they give us these self-help measures so they give us you know screen time to, so we know how much time we spend on our phones or they let us have the option you know of changing um how much time we spend on each app but we have to choose it and when it came out people were excited but if you look at screen time it just keeps going up and up because because it doesn't really target the most addictive features of the technology and it puts the responsibility on us. It's a bit like parental controls. Parental controls are complicated. They keep changing, not for the better necessarily, and but it means that we, the parents, are responsible. And we feel like we're responsible and we feel that we fail 
and we blame ourselves. Well, you call this the illusion of control. Talk about that a little bit. Yes. So first of all, we it started from like none of us. Of course, you never thought, you know, I will choose to spend 27 hours mm-hmm. a week on social media. And neither did any of us think I would want to spend five hours a day on my phone, which is what the average American does. Neither did anybody say we want, I want my child to be nearly constantly online, which is what is half of teens say they do. And what happened was that basically sometime around 2009, things started changing and we just made small decisions. So we decided to start emailing on the go or texting on the go or joining Facebook. And we thought it was a small decision. We didn't realize how each of this decision will end up factoring in, in terms of time. For me, for example, I live in Manhattan. I commute to New Jersey for work. And I used to be on the train and I started emailing and I started texting my babysitters. And very soon I would be on the train. I wouldn't notice a colleague or a student. Or I wouldn't see anything. And so... We were under this illusion that we were making the choice, but we didn't really make the big choice of how much time this is going to be. And then this illusion was intensified by these self-help methods because we are given parental controls. We are given the ability to, uh, you know, to know how much time we spend on our phone or to make our phone gray, but then we don't do that. So we think that we did not make the right choice when we could have. Well, the fact is we're not really the choice makers. The technology companies are making the choices for us. Hmm. And the screen time feature where we can limit our screen time on an iPhone, that really wasn't ever made to really work, right? It was just designed to make us feel like we were in control. Yeah. And if they really wanted it to work, this would be the default. Let's say you you would have a default of two hours. It doesn't mean that you could not extend it. But that would be the option, the baseline option. And when people get a baseline option, they tend to stick with it, or at least they think that's the recommended option. When it's the opposite, people end up not using it. And that's what the surveys showed, that people got excited and then they stopped trying. Yeah, I think pretty much everyone just bypasses it and types in the password and and gives themselves more time. I mean, maybe it works for some people, but I think it's, it's unlikely. Um, The thing that worked for me, especially regarding Instagram, was that I unfollowed everyone. So I literally had no more newsfeed. And so it just, there was nothing to look at. And I I stopped posting, so no one was messaging me. So I had no messages to respond to. Um, So I haven't actually gotten off of it, but the activity level has decreased so much that I've completely lost interest in it. I think adults can do it sometimes for certain things. I mean, I don't think, I mean, I I have three email accounts. I don't think I could stop looking at them. But yes, I could probably get off a social network. But I don't think that teens or younger people really have this option anymore because their entire social life is there. You're really isolating yourself if you get off. And that is the problem. We are sort of, we did not make a choice early on. And now we're in a situation where our life is so integrated with screens, it's very difficult, especially for younger people, to make a different choice. And that's why I'm arguing in the book for our need to make a collective choice to change how things are designed, how space how we live in spaces in order to change things, because it's very difficult for one individual especially young people by themselves to make this choice. You're right. I mean, I it's taken me years to get to this point and only with lots and lots of self-reflection mm-hmm. have I been able to maintain somewhat some semblance of a balance. Of course, it's not perfect by any means. But something that I'm noticing increasingly, especially with kids who have recently gotten a cell phone like the 10, 11, 12-year-old range, um as a therapist now seeing kids this age range in my office is that I'm seeing a lot of kids with their phones blowing up constantly with messages. And then they're simultaneously saying, I don't have any friends, which makes me wonder if we're creating this sort of illusion of being connected, but still isolated. I I, right? I think you're ac- actually, you're, you're correct. I think what they're 
um, saying is what we're also seeing in surveys. Lots of kids still feel lonely. And then you look at the um, huge uh, climb in rates of uh, depression and anxiety and suicide, especially among girls. There's something about this form of connection which does not make people feel really connected. And it's interesting because for a long time we knew that long-term relationships are important, but we didn't realize that it's the short-term face-to-face interactions that make us feel happier. And happiness studies show that when you talk to somebody, look them in the eye, smile at them, even if it's a fleeting moment, if it's, even if it's just a child in a playground, people feel much better. And all of this is gone when you're texting, when you're on social network. So, and that's even putting aside, you know, communications which make people feel worse about themselves. Just talking about the um, quality of the interaction. Yeah, it's interesting because I think so many parents resist giving their kids phones, resist giving their kids social media, and then finally give in because of the pleas to, oh, but everybody else has it and I feel disconnected or I don't feel connected if I'm not a part of it. But then we give them the technology and then they still feel disconnected. I guess that's something that's unexpected for for me as a parent and as a clinician. Yeah, that that is interesting. But the only thing they have no other way to connect, so they think that's the only way. Maybe that's part of why people feel so powerless. There's nothing you cannot. At the end, you have to give your child a phone. You mm-hmm. cannot prohibit them from going on social networks. Once you get to you know late middle school, you cannot just say no. And it's not the thing is it doesn't improve the situation at all. And that's why I I really think we have to think: Are we winning this? internal battles with ourselves. And I think you're very unique in having done what you've done. Or are we winning our family battles? Is this the way to go? Or what I believe we need to do is work through collective action, both and through legal action, but also as communities, because parents can do a lot in communities to change things. And these things could have much more of an impact than fighting by yourself with your child. Oh my gosh, that's so true. And I have at least one kid who, um, that's what it feels like, right? The the family struggle of constantly needing to to manage the screen time and the battles over the screen time. And that's, that's hard. And I've actually, I've had this thought. So my daughter is at a school that's pretty small. Um, in first grade, there's only 20 kids. And she'll be with these same 20 kids for the next several years until maybe through middle school. So I was thinking, what if I proposed to the parents that we come up with some kind of contract where we all say no phones until this age or no social media until this age? Are people doing that? Is that, then I also feel like I'm like overstepping on other people's personal business. What do you think? Well, there's actually a website. There's the parents uh, who congregate and create this websites where classes can make a pledge together to wait until eighth grade to give uh, the kids a cell phone. Mm. And I think I think it's a patch. I think we, ha- we have to, I believe we're going to see legal change. We're already seeing a lot of push towards legal change. But there's a generation of children that's been exposed to screens for so many years. And we have to think about what we do about that. So I think any year that's gained is a good year, not in a way that isolates your child. I think... Parents and schools also have an important role. Right now, the policy, the education policy, is the more technology in school, the better. That's the federal policy. That's how schools get funding. And for a while, even though this was the policy, you know, teachers had their way of teaching, so it didn't really happen. But then the pandemic took place, and teachers had to entertain kids, and they started uh, teaching through games, through Minecraft, through Roblox. These games opened education departments. The teachers started uh, posting their lectures on TikTok. So things have changed. And now there's much more screen time and much more integration of technology in the classroom. I think still, this is a play, this is something that's decided often on a school by school basis, district by district. And it's important for parents to get involved in these decisions because what happens at school doesn't stay at school. It infiltrates to the home because if you're working on your screen in school, then homework is going to be on screen as well. And then 
you don't know what your child is doing if they're playing a game or they're doing homework. If Minecraft is schoolwork, how could you tell your child not to play Minecraft for three hours? So I think it's very important for parents to know that they're not powerless, that they have agency and there are things that they can do. They just have to focus on the public sphere, not so much on the private sphere. We're going to pause for a one minute word from today's sponsor. The sponsor for today is Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. You don't have to spend hours on multiple job sites looking for the right candidates with the right skills. You can do it all with Indeed. Join over 3 million businesses worldwide that are using Indeed to hire great talent fast. Indeed knows that when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. They have awesome features like Indeed Instant Matching, where matching occurs as soon as you sponsor a post. You get a short list of quality candidates whose resumes match your job description. Visit indeed.com slash families to start hiring now. Just go to indeed.com slash families. Indeed.com slash families. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing is not available for everyone. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. In your book, you compare technology to cigarettes and our battle against cigarettes. Can you talk more about that? Yeah. So I, for me, this was one of the most personal parts in the book when I realized the connection between cigarettes and uh, and technology. I basically, I went to a friend's house one evening and the kid was 11 and uh, he was playing with the iPad and the parents told him we came in, said the guests are here, you have to stop playing with the iPad and they took the iPad away and he started screaming like a toddler, he was so furious and so all evening he just kept looking for the iPad and just, I suddenly remembered a few years later my father was diagnosed with emphysema. And emphysema is one of these diseases that's caused by smoking, but if you stop smoking, it doesn't progress. So we tried to convince him to stop smoking and we took his cigarettes away. And he was so angry and not in a, a characteristic way. And he did everything he could to get his cigarettes back, just like the boy did with the iPad. And I realized suddenly that there was a connection here. So I spent the next few years studying the food industry and the tobacco industry and privacy and all these fights to see the connection. And one of the most important things I saw that they all have in common was basically blaming the consumer or the user. So whenever the truth came out that what they were producing was addictive, whether it was junk food or cigarettes, they would say, well, you chose to smoke, you chose to eat, so you're responsible for any health consequences. Same is happening with the tech industry already. Uh, game makers are saying the kids are choosing to play. They or their parents are responsible. They give us these tools so we will think we are able to, we're responsible, we can choose how much time we want to spend online. And so I I think it's important to look at this because it also shows us the way out. And if you see where this argument of self-responsibility breaks, it's with children. And that's what happened with cigarettes. Uh, with cigarettes, the first thing, I mean, children cannot buy cigarettes in most states until they're 21. You cannot imagine that adults will not be able to buy cigarettes. Same with food and the fight against obesity. You know, schools... Uh, are mandated to weigh children and to send uh, the parents the BMI. I could not imagine going to work and having my employer weigh me. So we think about children as not being the choice makers, and therefore not responsible. So it's important to know that the argument can break here. And that's why where we're going to see change, and we're already starting to see change, is where children are concerned. Hmm. Can you tell me about some of the changes that are in the works or you hope for in the near future? We're, we're seeing a lot of class actions brought by parents against social media for addicting kids and causing them for, to spend so much time online. And therefore, uh, the consequences we talked about, the 
depression, the anxiety, the high rates of suicide. Very interesting. We're seeing now lawsuits by school districts who are saying we have to deal with all the costs of mental health. The Seattle uh, school district just sued a few weeks ago. Now New Jersey filed a lawsuit. Um, so this is really important. It's basically uh, people who are not using saying we are bearing the cost of this. Uh, we also, for a few years now, we had uh, lawsuits against uh, gay manufacturers. And the most important one is progressing in Quebec against Fortnite, when they're really getting to the core of it, the addictive features of Fortnite. And they are the same features which are all over the internet. They're not special to Fortnite. So that's definitely one place. We are seeing a lot of legislation. They're all bills. Uh, there's a Utah bill now to prohibit kids under 16 from going on social media. There is another federal bill doing the same thing. Now, it's very important to understand that even if a bill fails, it's not necessarily a failure because it takes time. There were lots of failed privacy bills. We're seeing much more privacy protection for children than before. So failure gets attention gets uh, publicity and exerts pressure and that's what we really want we want we're not the goal is not to say no screens we're not going back to a screenless world we're not going to back to no connectivity but where we want to go is to a place where our technologies are not designed to addict us where we don't have these features that are just there to keep us online for longer and that is the goal and even failed litigation, even failed bills exert pressure on technology makers. Can you give us some examples of specific features that are intended to keep us long on longer? Yeah, I think for me, the worst one is snap streaks. Snap streaks is a part of Snapchat and basically mostly used by kids. So if a kid sends another kid a streak and the other kid returns a streak within 24 hours, they have a snap streak. And they can keep going. The more days they keep going, there's a chart and the name would appear and there will be a number, maybe 134 with a special badge. And they collect these streaks with different people. This is like their chart of popularity. Mm -hmm. Now, there's nothing here. There doesn't have to be a content. The only thing is they should never miss a day. So it's not about what you send or a beautiful picture or nothing. But if you ever miss a day, you lose your streak. You lose your streak. You lose all your friend. So you understand how devastating this could be for a child. Mm -hmm. So, and the whole goal for Snap Streak is to get people to go back to their platforms so people will see their ads. Mm. Yeah, that's a perfect example of being connected in a very surface level type of way, right? You might be sending a picture of like your shoe and that counts as being connected for a day. Absolutely. Even just a few syllables. Yeah. What are some others? So um, basically what they did here, they took um, principle, psychology principles that have been known for years and they turned them into design principles. So one of the most well-known ones that's used a lot is the intermittent reward system. The idea is that uh, when we get rewards uh, on an irregular basis, then our brain secretes more of the neurotransmitter dopamine, which gives us pleasure. So that's why people use a slot machine, because they never know when they're going to get coins. So they keep pulling and pulling the lever. Eventually, they get, get some, and so they keep going and going. And this is all over the internet. That's why we keep checking Facebook. Maybe today I'm going to get some comments. Maybe today I'm going to get some likes. And uh, we have uh, the pull to refresh. We keep pulling and pulling. So maybe we'll get something. You go on um, Twitter and you swipe and you swipe. And maybe once in a while you'll get, you'll get a, a match. In, on games, they have a feature called loot boxes, which is like, like surprise boxes that you, if you want to get extra powers or extra costumes, then you can see the surprise boxes. You don't know what's in them. Uh, you can even pay for them, which is part of the problem. And that's why there have been so many lawsuits around this. 
But since you don't know what's in there, you keep opening and opening and opening them, hoping to get to get what you want. Again, the intermittent reward model. So that's um, a principle that's been applied in so many ways. Mm, yeah. The endless scroll is one that comes to mind for me, too. Right. Absolutely. And that's another principle. They've taken away our stopping cues. So that comes from a very famous experiment, a soup experiment, that they gave people soup. And some people had a regular bowl of soup, so they ate soup. And some people had this uh, bowl where you, they couldn't see the bottom. <laughs> so they ate 70% more. They didn't even realize they were doing oh, wow. it. That is what's happening to us online. Basically, yeah. they've taken a stopping cue. So there's, you know, there's never an end to the page, exactly what you just mentioned, you know, the infinite scroll. If you go on YouTube, you know, just the autoplay plays another video. Netflix plays another uh, episode of a TV series. It just goes on and on. These yeah. are features are just there to keep us for longer. They're not necessary. Yeah. I remember when, you know, back in the day on Facebook, um, there it actually, you would get to the end and it would say, you're all caught up and you were done, <laughs> right? You could walk away. And now it's not like that. I, well, now that I don't follow anyone on Instagram, there is an end, but you can bypass the end and it will just show you random things that things you might like. Um, so even though there is an end of people that you follow, there are still options, right? There's always options. Right. There are ads that can show you. There are lots of things yeah. that can show you. YouTube, I think, is an interesting one to talk about because it's um, it's a different type of a, a different type of addiction watching these videos that I mean, the most alarming part of it to me is that they're taking shows like my kids like to watch miraculous which is this cartoon and it's like a 20 minute show they take it on youtube youtube's people take it on youtube and they cut those episodes down into like one minute bits right so you take this show that's already short because our kids attention spans are already getting shorter and shorter and then you make it one minute long and you know our kids are flipping through a lot of kids will watch one minute of this one minute of that and youtube shorts now i think that's what they are they're one minute little bits um but it's it's terrifying to see the the rapid pace in which kids move through youtube and stumble upon things that they didn't even tend to, to stumble upon right and then you expect them to sit in the classroom and concentrate and you wonder why it's so difficult right right yeah how can you sit in a classroom even for 40 minutes when yeah. you struggle to watch a show for longer than one minute yeah, and I think that's the dilemma we are in, and we have to realize it's, on the one hand, you know, some part of us believes technology is good for a society, technology is good for our kids, they should know how to deal with technology. On the other hand, we, we are seeing what is happening to them, and we need to decide how to use technology in a way that will benefit them instead of drawing them into this uh, situation which are unable they're just waiting for the next d dopamine boost mm -hmm. and it's basically about ma making better technologies about for our children and realizing we need to make them soon because we have been in this scientific debate about is technology bad or good for us or for kids especially i'm talking about uh, screens for over a decade and over the last two or three years there's been so much data out there and in order to make good policy, you need to end the scientific debate. There has to be some uh, pronouncements by international bodies, by medical bodies, governmental bodies, that this is not a good thing. Like what we had with cigarettes when the Surgeon General announced in 1964. And it's important to get there because we keep delaying it. And this is based, and we can't just not do anything and neglect a whole generation of students, of, uh, kids in front of their screens with abusive technologies it's there's something has to be done and is not we don't have a lot of time to wait for this specific generation so what can we do as individuals uh, I, I think schools are very important as i mentioned earlier there are lots of ways to intervene in schools even in the way technology is evaluated in the classroom don't just incorporate it assess is this good for the student is it helpful or not helpful for the students. Do we need to have cell phones in schools? In France, France banned cell phones, so mm -hmm. kids will talk to each other in recess. 
there are lots and and I and I think that parents can also parents are part of this society. So whether you're a business owner, if you go to a restaurant now, many restaurants still have the QR codes left over from the pandemic. Oh, this I hate means those. Right, but this means everybody <laughs> has to yeah. get out of their phone. And I often walk off my house with my kids. They don't have their phones. But then we come to the restaurant and we have only one phone in order to see the menu. Yeah. So if you're a business owner, have paper menus. This way people will not put their phones on the table. You can create new norms. I often go into restaurants and people are sitting with their kids and iPads. Well, if you want to do something on a collective basis as a business owner, as a restaurant owner, have something else for the kids to do. There are things that we can do um, as as professionals. If you design technology, many people are designers. They don't think after what they're doing with the technology. Think, am I designing a technology? I'm designing a feature which is only there to keep my user on the platform for longer. If that's the case, is that what I want to do? If you're starting an online company, you're starting, do I want to use this model of advertising where my user time is my resource and their data is my resource? Or do I want to do something else? Maybe I want to have a subscription model. Maybe I want people to pay as they go. We all can contribute in so many ways towards creating different norms. And of course, there are legal measures, which, as I said, many parents are participating in class actions. But I think it's not just about being a legal activist. It's about thinking, how can you innovate in your person, in your community life, not necessarily around your dinner table? Right. Yeah, that that really hits home with me. And part of my uh, motivation to step away from social media last year was that I had a lot of people saying to me on Instagram that, oh, Danae, like you're one of the reasons I get on here every day, or you're the reason I stay on here. Or I only get on to read your content. And that's very flattering. But at the same time, I was feeling really bogged down with the way the social media was impacting my life. And hearing that I was bringing more people to it didn't sit well with me. And um, I think that my stepping away in some ways is is in hope that maybe others will, will do the same. But at the same time, I know that there's also a large chance they'll just sort of find someone else to um, that will motivate them to get on every day. It's 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 a double edged sword. Yeah, it is. I agree. It is complicated. But I do think that a restaurant that, you know, provides menus and other entertainment for kids actually would attract parents mm-hmm. who would want to have another yeah. day. And I think there are lots of ways to think. I mean, we didn't get to smokeless bars quickly. Nobody thought this mm-hmm. would ever happen. And now we cannot imagine a bar without phones everywhere and everybody looking at their phones. But there might be another way. Yeah. Yeah, I was just looking at pictures from a wedding in the early 2000s in a hotel, a big, beautiful hotel, and the lobby was just filled with smoke. Like you could see the smoke in the picture. <laughs> and I just look at it, I was like, wow, did we really live like that? <laughs> it's it's mind boggling that we really live like that. And now it's hard to conceive of that being a reality and in most parts of the world, I think. Right. And imagine a business that incentivizes people, you know, put your phone down, you'll get an extra drink. Right. Yeah. I think as parents, it's easy to recognize these changes that need to be made. But at the same time, I do see a lot of parents who have their own anxiety around being disconnected from their kids and not being able to reach their kids. And they are expecting their kids to be reachable any minute of the day. Do you, what do you, do you have any thoughts about that? I completely identify with that. I I remember very much a day, as I said, I I live in Manhattan, I work in New Jersey, and I remember I take the train. So the train goes under the Hudson River to New Jersey. And one day I got out, the train got out of the tunnel, and I realized I left my phone in Manhattan. And there was no time for me to go back to Manhattan to get my phone. I had to get to work. I had to teach a class. And I was anxious the entire day. I I thought nobody can reach me. And what happens if my babysitters need me? What happens if something happens to one of the kids in the schools? And so 
and I had to go to meetings and I didn't even, couldn't even check my emails. I actually left work early that day to go home to get my phone. So I know exactly what you're talking about. And I think many of us, and that's what you, you asked me earlier about, you know, being addicted. Maybe we don't qualify for all the symptoms of addiction, but we do have some of them. And many of us have some of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's one that a lot of people um, can relate to that, that fear really, it takes over your brain, right? When you don't have it, you're thinking about it. It's not just the, the numbers and the minutes that you spend on your phone, but it's the time you're not on your phone that you're wondering and thinking about your phone and what you're missing on your phone. And that was a big piece for me, right? That it was taking over my brain, even if I wasn't on it. And that is something that it feels, it feels scary to think. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So what about on a larger level, um, making change? Do you have any suggestions for individuals? For individuals, for themselves? I think it's possible to make small changes like what you have uh, suggested. You know, I, I write. So what I do is I, I just disconnect for 20 minutes increments so I could write and then I connect again. I don't think it's perfect. I think the most important thing you can do, make some changes. You can put your phone down, you know, when you're at home and try not to look at it. But the most important thing is not to blame yourself. This feeling of this thing of feeling guilty, I'm not doing well enough. Don't do that. Do what you can. Believe that there's already a movement taking place and things are going to change. So we're sort of trying to bridge the gap between now and when things will become easier especially for kids i think first of all because there's so much happening there's also antitrust actions against big tech there is a lot of movement not just uh, here but internationally that will make a difference so if you can make a small difference for yourselves and the way you change you use your lives it's a good thing but if you can't then just don't feel bad about it what about those of us who want to join the movement to make an impact on a policy level I think there are a lot of uh, congressmen that are in different states or on the federal level which are enacting bills. I think it's always good to check and to to write them and to show support. Uh, to write the the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, is taking more and more action to write the FTC. There are ways to do this, but I do still think that. Um, the most important thing is to try to make a difference in your communities because you'll feel a difference much faster. Mm. That's good. Good advice. So where can we find your book and where can we find you online? So my book is on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. Um, my website is GaiaBernstein.com. Great. Thank you so much, Gaia. This has been great. Thank you so much for having me. If you want the links to get in touch with Gaia and learn more about her work, go to simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 344. I appreciate you tuning in. Please take a minute to leave a rating or review for this podcast. That helps the show to reach more people. Thanks and have a good one.